this is uh, Patricia, Christopher, and Job from the OCF. And they're going to tell you about the OCF, which is a super exciting uh, student-run uh, organization. Um, hi, we're here from the Open Computing Facility student group here on campus. And we're going to talk about how we use Kubernetes uh, to, to help enable us for, for open contributions. So my name is Patricia Hannes. Um, I am a senior in the East Department. I am a former general manager in the club and a current internal lead, also a gamer. <laughs> yeah, I'm Christopher Cooper. Um, you, you might also see our emails, usernames up there. Sometimes we might refer to ourselves by our OCF usernames. So this would be HP. I'm Cooper C. Um, I'm currently uh, a senior in CS as well. Uh, undergrad, by the way, in case that wasn't clear. Uh, and I'm a uh, currently the one of the site managers at the OCF, um, and I like to play jazz. My name is Ja. Um, I'm also one of the current site managers. Well, my my username is Ja. Can you see that? Um, <laughs> I like cycling a lot. Cool. And also, um, also in the left corner there of mostly slides, we have a short URL to our presentation. If you guys want to follow along with the slides. Okay. So first we want to talk about our goals to kind of build a foundation for why we chose the infra that we did. So basically what are we trying to achieve and what principles we want to build around. So like I said, we're the Open Community Facility. We're a volunteer-based student-run org that basically our mission is to provide the computing resources that the campus needs and making them accessible. So here are some cool looking numbers. We're one of the school, uh, older CS orgs on campus. And so over the time, you know, we have uh, 60,000 plus accounts since we started. Um, we have 1,600 plus student group accounts and over 500 uh, active websites. And then just in this year, there's been a lot, a lot of use from our uh, software mirrors. So basically, the point of this is we have a lot of uh, high, high demand uh, industry level members that we're working with. So how can we accomplish our mission? So some of the things we want to do is we want to make it easy to contribute. This kind of goes back to our goals of we are student volunteers. We want to make that barrier of entry to contribute simple. Uh, we want quick iteration. We're students. Our time is limited and valuable. So, um, and then we want to give our volunteers industry relevant experience. So that's things that they can take out into the real world and they have over the years. And then we run our services on site. So there comes to our caveat. We technically don't run our Kubernetes in the cloud. Um, but we thought this would still be a really interesting uh, thing to explain like how we do it, and it is something that is normally run on the cloud. Cool, so technical objectives. What sort of uh, infra do we have? We have a couple of physical servers that we have in a server room in the basement of the MLK Student Center. Uh, we have a lot of traditional infra, infras that we use for like DNS, certificate, management, uh, LDAP, Kerberos, and we do config management using Puppet. So um, we use all of these things to run various services, such as like account creation, uh, our website, ticketing software, and a bunch of other miscellaneous things, including uh, an internal jukebox that people will, that staff members will use when they're in the lab. Cool, so I'll be taking over here. Um, I just wanted to introduce a um, uh, couple of technologies that we use to enable our volunteer staffers to contribute to the OCF in a meaningful way, um, quickly, and in an accessible way. So the first one we use is Docker. Um, we use Docker to package almost all the applications that we expose to services at the OCF. Um, it's nice because it means we don't have to manage our servers as much. Um, we don't have to manage the virtual machines on what services to run on. There's a consistent deploy method for everything. It's really nice and easy. In fact, we throw it on Kubernetes. 
um, Docker is very widely supported, and that means that you know for our use case, um, if something happens, um, a lot of orgs we can learn from what they've done, their mistakes. Um, for us specifically, we use Docker so that our volunteer staffers can just package the applications they want to put on our infrastructure. Um, it, it means that we have volunteer staffers with varying levels of experience in managing Linux servers from never seen Linux before to very experienced with Linux. Uh, it means that anyone who can write code can package the application, just learn Docker, and then they can even build off existing application images uh, because in Docker you can compose them on top of each other. It, for us, it really lowers the barrier of entry to contribute uh, services onto the OCF infrastructure and lets the like, students and staffers uh, volunteer their time effectively. Um, the next technology that we use is Kubernetes. Uh, we use Kubernetes to orchestrate all of our Docker containers. Um, it's really nice. It handles bringing them up and uh, keeping them alive. I'm sure you all know um, Kubernetes is very popular right now. Um, it also isolates our development environments. So what happens here is that um, if you want to try and deploy your service onto OCF, you can re literally just like test on your like development namespace on our own cluster, and that means that um, people can get like to, can see uh, how their application would react on Kubernetes before they're actually deployed in production. So the environment is exactly the same, and. For us, Kubernetes is nice because it's a consistent abstraction around the hardware. As, as I said, um, our volunteers have sometimes a limited experience, and so um, learning a single set of tools that they can use effectively is easier than having to learn a whole like set of skills that they will need to just deploy their application. Um, for us, Kubernetes isn't really about like high, avail high availability or scale, um, but instead, as I said, Kubernetes um, helps us because only a few people need to know about Kubernetes. Everyone else just needs to know how to deploy onto it. Um, furthermore, um, we use Jenkins to tie all this together. Um, Jenkins is our CI/CD system tool. Um, we use it for automatic deployment and automatic tests and automatically updating our services. So what does this mean? Um, at the OCF, our flow is very similar to most open source projects. Um, your volunteer staffer, um, everything at the OCF is open source. You um, you create a bunch of commits. You open a pull request. Jenkins automatically checks that the, all the tests pass. Um, this gives them confidence that yes, your code will work. It won't break anything. Um, it makes it easier to approve since um, we have a lot of we have a lot of services for such a small team of volunteer staffers, and it's important when the number of contributors has varying skill levels. And then after that, once it's been approved, everything looks checked out, looks good, we merge it, Jenkins automatically deploys it, and makes sure it stays updated. Awesome. Thank you, John. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so that's sort of the, the, the goals behind what we're trying to do, and the technologies that we use to actually get there. But what, what goes in the middle? Like, How do we actually use these technologies to achieve those goals? Uh, what are some of the challenges we face and how we approach that? Uh, so this is the part of the talk where it gets a little bit technical. So uh, you know, if, the, if 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 not everything is clear, you know, feel free to come up and ask us questions, talk to us afterwards, and we'd love to talk to you more about all of this. But first up is authentication, right? So we have, like like we talked about, we have a variety of volunteer staffers. We don't want to give everyone uh, admin permissions on the Kubernetes cluster, for instance. Um, but when you're using Kubernetes, we want people to have their own slice of the environment that they do have permission to manipulate. And for someone who um, does have full permissions like me, how do I authenticate myself and make sure that uh, the cluster set, like knows who I am? Uh, a lot of cloud services, so if you're using something like GKE or EKS um, on Amazon, uh, they sort of have, they might have systems built for this, but we can't use those systems because we're running this on our own servers. So what do we do instead? Um, so this is sort of uh, the framing of the problem. Um, KubeCuddle, if you, uh, just, just curious actually, how many people here have uh, heard of Kubernetes before? Okay, most people, that's good. How many people have here have uh, actually like used um, or administered a Kubernetes cluster? Oh wow, okay, that's a good number of people. That's promising to see. So uh, KubeCuddle, for those of you who haven't, KubeCuddle um, is a command line utility that is the primary method that you usually use when um, interacting with Kubernetes. Um, and so authentication, KubeCuddle authentication is the issue here. Um, like PHP mentioned, we have like 60,000 plus accounts. Um, we have an existing authentication system using Kerberos. 
Um, we want to take advantage of that. Everything else uses that, and this should too. We don't want to just throw that out. So how can we integrate that with uh, Kubernetes? And there's this choice quote from the Kubernetes documentation. Integrations with other authentication protocols, such as Kerberos, can be accomplished using an authentication proxy or the authentication webhook. This is uh, pretty much the only thing that is uh, the only mention of Kerberos in all of the Kubernetes documentation. So we really just had to figure this out on our own. What we ended up going with was a system that used X509 client certificates. So um, the way these work basically is uh, it's a private public key pair. Um, on your local client, you generate the private key, and then you sort of uh, submit this public key to become part of a signed certificate that's been signed by the Kubernetes master, which controls the certificate authority. Um, so that uh, the, the Kubernetes master you know, has this private key, which then signs your certificate. Um, and then once that's signed, um, it notes your username and your groups, which is important because that designates what you can actually do um, in the cluster. Once that's all signed, uh, you just present that with any request uh, to the cluster, and it's able to say, yes, this uh, checks out, this is a valid signature, and you are who you say you are. Um, so I'm gonna let you do this or not do this. Um, still though, this hasn't tied in with Kerberos yet, which is what we use for all of our other authentication. So how does that uh, fit in? Well, how does the master know you are who you say you are? Um, that's, that's sort of where this part comes in. We use, um, SSH, actually. Um, SSH is already enabled in all of our infrastructure um, to work with Kerberos. So we just use that and sort of bootstrap on top of that, this, this uh, system, which I'll explain in a second. So this is how this process works. Um, you're the client, you wanna make a request. First step, you generate a new private key for every request. Uh, and then you uh, connect to the Kubernetes master over a Kerberos authenticated connection. And you say, here's the public key, please uh, sign the certificate. Um, so the way we uh, escalate permissions here is actually using sudo. So for those of you who have, are familiar with uh, you know, Linux administration, you may have seen sudo before. You can specify specific rules um, for sudo use. So for instance, anyone who can actually log into um, our Kubernetes uh, master's servers um, can use this rule um, to sign uh, their certificate using this particular script as this particular user. Um, and that is the security mechanism that is sort of easiest to roll out for us and we're fairly confident in its security. Um, so that checks that you are who you say you are, adds some information um, to the certificate, signs it, sends it back to you and says, all right, you're good to go, make your request. So once we have that, um, once we have the signed certificate back to the client, the client can then present that uh, certificate keychain um, present the request to the normal Kubernetes API server. The Kubernetes API server can um, then process that request, uh, check that authorization, and then um, actually give you your response back. Um, it might sound complicated, but it comes down to like a few lines of code. This is actual production code that uh, is you know that we use every day. Um, you, there's a link to the GitHub for the full script actually. Um, but you know we just check: have we authenticated with Kerberos? If not. We uh, you know prompt for password, authenticate with Kerberos. Once you have that, generate our private key, generate our public key, SSH into our uh, Kubernetes master, and then run that sudo command. And that, <laughs> that's all there is to it. This is nice because this is a lightweight script. We actually just run this every single time you run kubectl. It automatically runs in the background and then passes those credentials um, into kubectl um, so that that is an authenticated request. This is what it looks like in use. So here I am connected to our admin server. Run kubectl get nodes, which lists all the nodes in our Kubernetes cluster. It pro I haven't authenticated with Kerberos yet, so it prompts for my password. Type in my password, and you can see the, uh, the request is probably authenticated. And then, say I run another request, I want to see all of the pods that are running um, OCF web, which is our website. Um, and it doesn't prompt for my password, I've already authenticated it, but it still gets a new cert, goes through the whole process, but it happens totally behind the scenes and it's actually pretty quick. So uh, together this makes it really uh, easy for us to manage the cluster and it's also an effective way to um, give volunteers um, access to specific parts of the cluster, which is really useful for development. Which gets to my next point, which is uh, deployment. So this is us using the cluster, but we wanna automatically be deploying as we're developing. Um, this is what Jaw talked about with Jenkins. So how do we actually do this? We, you know, we have a bunch of services, we deploy uh, multiple times daily, usually across several, and we rarely actually have failures in production. So how is that possible? Um, so 
Here's some uh, nice little screenshots. Um, if you've ever used Jenkins before, you'll recognize the screenshot on the left. If you've ever used GitHub, you'll recognize the screenshot on the right. So on the left is Jenkins. The thing to note about here, the thing to note about this screenshot is this is a this is actually a screenshot I took today um, of OCF Web, which I mentioned is our website. Um, you can see that every single branch there, which corresponds to every Git branch in the website, is being automatically built and tested. Um, and if there's a failure there, it will let you know. And the way it lets you know is um, you can look on the right. This is a pull request, one that I have open right now. I think it's still going through review. Uh, you can see a little bit of discussion at the top. Um, but the key thing I want to focus on is sort of this middle section, right? You can see um, someone has requested changes. A couple people have approved it. So, you know, that's manual review. But then below that, you have some nice green check marks. Those are, that's Jenkins saying, yep, I uh, ran the linter. I built the Docker image successfully. I ran the automated tests. All looks good. So um, this stuff is really important because we do not merge unless all of those checks are green. And that gives us a lot of confidence that the code that we're actually putting into production is code that works. The, the final step uh, that Jenkins is really effective in um, is, like we said, automatic deployment into production. So it's useful for our review process, but once code is reviewed, we want it to actually go out into the real world. So the way that works is this is the commits, uh, the git commits to our master branch of our website. You can see next to each one, there is a green check mark or, or a red X. Um, so the green check mark is the successful deployment. Red X is usually doesn't indicate any failure in production, but maybe um, there was some problem with the tests or maybe uh, some other uh, commit after that fixed an issue. Um, uh, but the important thing to note is that this really enables us to iterate quickly because as soon as we merge a commit, that is in production, right? If we need to revert it, we just uh, you know create another commit reverting it. Um, so we are always confident that our master branch on GitHub, publicly accessible, able to be contributed easily by anyone, we're always confident that that's matching up what's actually running in production on our cluster, which is like, makes things just much easier to manage. And also, as far as the red X's, um, you know, these are some changes if that maybe test failed or something like that. But you know, if test fail, if there's a failure in the deploy process, that stuff doesn't ever hit production. Um, so those don't correspond to issues in production. Um, and well, I just wanted to cover my back a little bit there, I guess. So what does this look like from a developer perspective, right? I'm a volunteer, I wanna make changes to the website. Um, why is this model important? Um, the answer is because we want to have a perspective that is both simple and consistent across all of our services. Uh, like I mentioned, we have sort of, you can go to our GitHub and look at how many repositories we have, it's a lot. Um, but we want the experience developing on all of those to be very consistent. Um, so the way we do this is through a shared pipeline in Jenkins. Jenkins is sort of built around these pipelines, which um, are how you configure deployments. And we sort of try and share as much as possible between repositories. So uh, it basically every repository boils, almost all repositories, boil down to these steps, right? The first is Jenkins runs tests. If the tests fail, we back out, report the failure, right? Assuming the tests pass, we move on, we try and actually build a Docker image. Um, and you can see these are all using make, so, um, all of our repositories have make files, and they have a, sort of this consistent language. You run make this to, you run, sorry, you run make cook image, which will build a Docker image. Run make push image, which will push that to a Docker repository such as Docker Hub or our own internal repository. Um, and this means that basically the deploy steps are always gonna be the same, and Jenkins always knows what they are. Um, so make the test, build the image, push the image, and then the last step is sort of the most interesting for this talk, which is we check to see if there's a directory in this project called Kubernetes. And if there is, we know that that directory is going to contain the actual Kubernetes configuration that this needs to run. In this case, like YAML specifying a deployment or a service or a persistent volume or something like that. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, you may know what those are. Um, so that's pretty simple. We just look for those YAML files, um, maybe replace a version with the newly built version of the Docker image, and then push that out onto deployment and uh, watch it deploy. Um, it ends up looking like this. This is an actual Jenkins run from probably today or yesterday or something. And you can see all of the check marks getting hit. Um, and now we know that this is actually in production. So this really simple workflow, um, and it makes it really effective um, for us to actually do quick and open development. Cool.
cool. So I'll be wrapping us up with a bit of like a postmortem of the lessons we learned and some of the ways that we feel like we can improve as an org. Okay. So some of the reasons that Kubernetes is good for us kind of reflects back to our goals. It's industry standard software, which means that we can give our student volunteers relevant experience that will be useful for them as they go into the industry. And has, as we have many alums who've like ended up going to like successful startups and fame companies. Um, it simplifies contribution. So it's about lowering that barrier of entry so that people, everyone feels like they can make contributions. And it has great con uh, documentation. Again, that kind of leads back to the lowering the barrier of entry for contrib contributions. Now, Kubernetes is not good for everyone. It's not designed really to run on bare metal. It's very complex and takes a lot of like experience and investment to get it up and running. And you don't really see the benefits until you reach scale. Honestly, these disadvantages apply to us too, but we decided that those pros that I listed a minute ago outweigh these cons for us. So here are some people on Twitter who generally share the sentiment. So Copy Construct said, it takes well over a million dollars, just an engineer's salary, to get Kubernetes up and running from scratch, and you still might not get there. Or, more humorous and simply put, I am developer says every intro to Kubernetes tutorial, and it's a sign on a door that says, we are open, the door is just very heavy. <laughs> so, to wrap things up into a final slide, some of the things that we are currently working on to improve include logging. Because currently, right now, logs just kind of disappear after a time. Um, so our eventual goal would be to deploy a centralized system to collect these logs. Uh, monitoring, we don't really have any. Uh, so it'd be nice to get some. Basically, we have monitoring in other areas of our infra, but we need to add it for Kubernetes still. Development, so right now when you do development, it's in the same cluster as production. Uh, we right now need to make a separate uh, cluster for production. This runs into issues. So just the other day we had an admin who deleted all of our nodes, so everything went down. This is what happens when your development uh, cluster is the same as your production one. Uh, and then resiliency. So while Kubernetes itself is built to be resilient, um, some of our other infra relies on everything to be up. So we would like to create more resistance uh, in the future. And so that wraps everything up. Um, thanks for listening to us. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. We will be around for networking later, and there are other uh, OCFers who also are planning on being around. Let's see, you can reach out to us at ocf.io slash contact. The slides are at that short URL I mentioned earlier. And yeah, thank you.